I want to address this point that you have to follow the law. What's the law? Who decides what the law is? You'll hear this case thrown around Marbury versus Madison. Most lawyers like this case. I don't. And I want to give you a little history lesson. We do that a lot on this program because you're the most intelligent audience of any audience. I want to give you a little history lesson about how this came to be, the power of the judiciary, because it is certainly not explicitly stated in your Constitution. And this is from Men in Black, starting on page 29. I am not promoting this book. This book is 10 years old. It's 11 years old. It's my first book. The title is Men in Black, How the Supreme Court is Destroying America. While the Constitution created the silhouette of the national judiciary, it was up to Congress to actually form it with legislation that would constitute a functional system of federal courts. You see, Congress is given the power to create the lower courts. The federal district courts were created by Congress. The appellate courts were created by Congress. The districts in which the district courts exist are created by Congress. The circuits in which the appellate courts exist are created by Congress. Moreover, they can increase the number of justices on the Supreme Court. Originally there were seven, now there are nine. The Supreme Court's jurisdiction, beyond that which is specified in the Constitution, can also be set by Congress. Did you know that? And yet when I mention this, it's like, wow, what a whack job. No, it's not a whack job. That's what the framers did. So the Constitution creates this silhouette of the national judiciary, and it leads it up to Congress to create the rest. And Congress did this with the Judiciary Acts of 1789 and 1801. Now, the biggest problem with the Judiciary Act of 1801 was timing. The bill was introduced before the presidential election of 1800, but was not passed by the Federalist-controlled Congress until after the election. And while the deadlock presidential election was being determined by the House of Representatives, it was a fight between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, among others. And it went on for over 30 ballots, by the way. President John Adams signed the bill on February 13, 1801, just three weeks before the end of his term in office. So here he signs the Judiciary Act of 1801 three weeks before he leaves office with the Federalist Congress. He also sent to the Federalist-controlled Senate nominees for the 16 new judgeships, 16 new judgeships, and they were confirmed shortly before the end of his administration. So he was trying to obviously stuff the courts, pack the courts, before he was leaving office. He lost the election. The Federalists lost the Congress. Ultimately, Thomas Jefferson would be president. The Republican Democrats, his party, took over. So what Adams was trying to do before he left office was stack the judiciary. So these judges came to be called Adams Midnight Judges, some of whom became the subject of the seminal case Marbury versus Madison. On March 8, 1802, just days after Thomas Jefferson's followers, the Republicans, took control of both houses of Congress, Congress repealed the Judiciary Act of 1801. Luckily, there wasn't a Mitch McConnell in the Senate, and none of this would get done. So, Jefferson wins, his party wins, they repeal the act. On April 29, 1802, Congress enacted a new Judiciary Act, the Judiciary Act of 1802, which, among other things, abolished the 16 new judgeships that Adams had created before he left office and his Federalist Party in Congress. Well, this is what stirred this decision. Marbury versus Madison. In its 1803 Marbury versus Madison decision, the Supreme Court determined that it had the power to decide cases 
about the constitutionality of congressional or executive actions, and when it deemed they violated the Constitution, overturned them. Now, the shorthand label given to this court-made authority is judicial review. And this, quite literally, is the foundation for the runaway power that's now exercised by the federal courts to this day. But what is far less recognized is that Marbury started out as anything but started out as anything but the ominous precedent it has become today, in my humble opinion. Now you're about to know more than anybody else. Marbury was a brilliantly conceived political strategy crafted by John Marshall, a master politician. Marshall, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, wrote the decision not to set a revolutionary precedent, but to deny the new president, Thomas Jefferson, his longtime political rival, an opportunity to rebuff a Supreme Court controlled by Jefferson's Federalist opponents. Marbury was precipitated by the election of 1800, in which Jefferson, the incumbent vice president and leader of the Republicans, ran for president against the incumbent president, John Adams, leader of the Federalists. The Federalists controlled both houses of Congress, but were torn between the followers of Adams and Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton's faction withheld its support for Adams' re-election bid in 1800, and the race ended in an electoral college tie between Jefferson and his vice presidential running mate, Aaron Burr. Burr basically stabbed Jefferson in the back. He was supposed to be Jefferson's vice president. But because he tied in electoral college votes, he decided he wanted to be president. This is the same Aaron Burr that had a duel with Alexander Hamilton eventually, and it killed Hamilton. John Adams came in third. So the election was then thrown into the House of Representatives. Should they pick Burr or Jefferson? Realizing he would not win the election, Adams moved to solidify his party's influence in the federal government. Let me add here that Hamilton eventually threw his support behind Jefferson, who he didn't like at all, and Jefferson didn't like him at all, but he despised Burr more. So Jefferson won. But Adams knew he wasn't going to win, so he moved to solidify his party's influence in the federal government. They passed the Judiciary Act of 1801, creating these 16 new federal circuit judgeships, and that was part of his strategy. Just prior to leaving office, Adams selected and the Federalists controlled lame duck Senate conferred nominees to fill the posts. Adams' turn ran out, however, before John Marshall, who was then his Secretary of State, could actually deliver the commissions of office to some of the designees. Marshall's successor as Secretary of State was James Madison. He was Jefferson's Secretary of State. He refused to deliver these commissions at Jefferson's direction. And William Marbury, among others, filed suit in federal court seeking an order, what we call a writ of mandamus, directing Madison to deliver his commission as Justice of the Peace. Now Marshall, a long-time rival of Jefferson's in Virginia politics, had been one of the most articulate leaders in the Federalist Party. He'd served in the Virginia State House, in the U.S. House of Representatives, and he was one of President Adams' representatives to France in 1797, and then as Secretary of State. He was nominated to be Chief Justice by President Adams and assumed the post on February 4, 1801, exactly one month before Adams left office. So there's Jefferson. He wins office. He wins the presidency. Adams was stuffing the courts. And he put as the new Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court one of Jefferson's greatest political rivals and one of Adams' closest confidants. With a Republican majority elected to both houses of Congress in 1800, Marshall realized Jefferson and his Republicans could denude the Supreme Court of authority and that he as Chief Justice could be impeached and removed from office. Those things were actually thought about back then. They were still on the table, unlike today. 
So Marshall understood that in the Marbury case, if he ordered Secretary of State Madison to deliver Marbury's commission for that chief, for that uh, Justice of the Peace job, Jefferson would order Madison to ignore the Supreme Court's writ, and the court's authority would be seriously weakened. Marshall was also concerned that he not be seen as protecting the interests of Federalist jurists like Marbury, who had assumed his position as Justice of the Peace and had been hearing cases issuing judgments for a year. But, of course, it was Marshall who signed off on it, wasn't it? So bearing all this in mind, Marshall had to figure out what to do. And we have Marshall's decision in Marbury. While upsetting the Constitution's balance of power, in my opinion, and the relationship between the federal government and the states, his opinion was a master political stroke. Marshall stated that Marbury, consistent with legal doctrine at the time, had something akin to a property right to the office to which he'd been nominated and confirmed. But Marshall also said that the federal judiciary should be able to issue an order directing the appointment of Marbury, but because the Constitution did not enumerate such an original right for the Supreme Court, the court was powerless to do so. But then Marshall went well beyond the specific issues in the case. He said that the court had a responsibility to set aside acts of Congress that violate principles enumerated in the Constitution. He wrote this. Between these alternatives, there's no middle ground. The Constitution is either a superior paramount law, unchangeable by ordinary means, or it is on a level with ordinary legislative acts, and like other acts, is alterable when the legislature shall please to alter it. If the former part of the alternative be true, then a legislative act contrary to the Constitution is not law. If the latter part be true, then written constitutions are absurd attempts on the part of the people to limit the power in its own nature illimitable. He went further. Certainly all those who have framed written constitutions contemplate as forming the fundamental and paramount law of the nation. Consequently, the theory of every such government must be that an act of the legislature repugnant to the Constitution is void. The judicial power of the United States is extended to all cases arising under the Constitution. Could it be the intention of those who gave this power to say that in using it, the Constitution should not be looked into? That a case arising under the Constitution should be decided without examining the instrument under which it arises? This is too extravagant to be maintained. So Marshall's Federalist Party had lost the presidency in Congress, but Marbury was determined to fight back. And so the doctrine of judicial review was born. Yes, the Constitution is indeed the supreme law of the land, but now the court, by its own fiat, would decide what is or is not constitutional. The Constitution's structure, including the balance of power between the three branches, in my view, was now altered. Although Jefferson is claimed to be modern by modern Democrats as the father of their political party, he was a leading opponent of judicial activism. After Marbury, Jefferson became an even more vocal critic of what he viewed as the overreaching of the judiciary under Marshall's leadership. I might add a footnote here, a verbal one. Marshall should never have been involved in this case. He should have recused himself since he was involved in the appointment in the first place. That's what an ethical judge or justice would have done. You can't be involved in a case in which you have material involvement. But you watch as these slip and fall lawyers out there of all colors, political stripes is what I mean, of all political colors and stripes, defend him and defend this. This is their holy grail. To Abigail Adams, John Adams' wife, Jefferson wrote a year after Marbury, quote, The Constitution meant that its coordinate branches should be checks on each other, but the opinion which gives to the judges the right to decide what laws are constitutional and what not, not only for themselves in their own sphere of action, but for the legislator and the executive also in their spheres, would make the judiciary a despotic branch. And Jefferson's concern about judicial power grew stronger as he passed into old age. For Monticello... In 1820, the author of the Declaration of Independence wrote to 
William J. Jarvis, the following, William C. Jarvis, quote, to consider the judges as the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions. It's a very dangerous doctrine indeed, and one which would place us under the despotism of an oligarchy. Our judges are as honest as other men and not more so. They have with others the same passions for party, for power, and the privilege of their core, and their power the more dangerous as they are in office for life and not responsible as the other functionaries are to the elective control. The Constitution has erected no such single tribunal, knowing that to whatever hands confided with the corruptions of time and party, its members would become despots. It has more wisely made all the departments co-equal and co-sovereign within themselves. And I could go on, ladies and gentlemen, but let me say this. He was right. And the way that I determined to address this is in the Liberty Amendments. With term limits for Supreme Court justices and the power of three-fifths of the state legislatures to overturn a majority Supreme Court decision. It is far more Republican, far more in keeping the faith with the framers than what we have today. Anthony Kennedy ruling over all matters cultural and social. <laughs> 